mistake and brought my dissertation to read. I, I, hope, I hope you don't mind. It's, uh, <laughs> um, one of the things that interests me philosophically, and I've, this is part of that project, is how creativity and novelty appear in the universe. And I've spent a lot of time thinking and writing about novelty and creation. And this started when I was a graduate student in uh, North Carolina, looking at ants under a microscope. And I was struck with their beauty, their, their, the, 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 the way that their chitin shells shimmer. It just, it took my breath away. And I turned to uh, the museum director and I said, these are the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And he said, that's the biggest secret. Nobody knows how gorgeous ants are. But it started me thinking about novelty and creation, and, and it, it, you can't help but look at nature very long and not be struck by how beautiful and how magnificent and how novel everything was. And, and novelty begets novelty. I, um, part of my research has been with um, Nicholas uh, Luhmann's uh, art as uh, social history. Uh, and he uses evolutionary principles to show how things stabilize and how novelty emerges. And my, my classic example is, is the emergence of beavers in the uh, uh, ancient history. Rocky Mountain streams used, used to just run to, the, run to the, the lakes and rivers. And it, with the appearance of beavers, when beavers evolved, it precipitated this evolutionary flurry of cattails and brown trout and all these other things that make use of their, prawn, their, their pond. And, and, and so as I write and I think, I'm enamored with novelty. I'm, I'm struck with how it, it, how it emerges. And this, this book, Gilda Trillum, is kind of in that spirit. And I, I need to warn you, let me give you my uh, surgeon's general warning here. This is, this is a little bit different. It's kind of postmodern magical realism. And, and in the preface it says, an academic work disguised as a novel, disguised as an academic work. And what I mean by that, this is actually the fictional character Kit Wixom's master's thesis. So I wrote a master's thesis as a novel. Uh, he did. It, it, get, it gets complex. <laughs> Uh, and so it has kind of an academic flavor. It says, note some references in this novel are in the end notes are authentic and some are fictional creations. Distinguishing between the two is left as an exercise for the reader. <laughs> so you can have fun with this too. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna open with the preface and this is, this is uh, Kat's opening to his dissertation. I'm gonna read some, some of his discoveries about Gilda Trillum. Gilda Trillum is a Mormon writer, or kind of a lapsed Mormon writer, uh, who, who lived in the 50s. She's a poet and a minimalist novel. And what I mean by minimalist novel is she provides a list of nouns and verbs and adjectives for you, and then you, you, you do with that what you want. And there's some academic debates on whether this was supposed to be a meditative device or a, a, a construction of an alternate reality. But that doesn't get in the way of the story, I promise. It's way more interesting than reading her minimalist novels. So this is, this is I, I'm from Moab, by the way. That, that needs to be understood if this isn't going to make any sense. Uh, so, so Kat begins, call me Kat, my mother did. I am Rusty and Chastity Mender's boy. This is my thesis. It will be bound in a light blue cover with a glow in the dark star sticker, glow in the dark star stickers gracing the cover, added by my sister Wyona. For such I promised her she could do, and I always keep my promises. My thesis committee suggested that I give some personal details about my life to help the future reader get to know a bit about me. Not that I matter. It's just good to know the sources of things sometimes. It's getting dark now, and I've just lit the lantern. I'll start the generator in a bit. The sheep I'm tending are nearby, up on the eastern flank of Wass in the LaSalle Mountains of southeastern Utah. I'm watching them for a month so the herders can take a short vacation back to Bolivia. My dad likes me to touch base with our family's roots and spend some time doing what the menders have always done for near 150 years, ranch sheep. It's early fall, elk are whistling, and their breeding, their breeding status nearby. 
just for fun, I go out on the front steps of the Round Sheep Warriors trailer and slip a play call in my mouth and imitate their voice. I sound out long and loud like a lusty male, one ready to breed and fight. The two go hand in hand often enough, and I get a lively response, so press the matter on. Even though there is still a glow in the west, it's getting dark. I sit down on the top step and watch as the first stars of Cassiopeia appear above the hills to the north northeast. A male is rubbing his horns through the branches. It is near. I walk to the bottom of the steps and pick up a small aspen branch loaded with terminal twigs, one left over from a dead tree I chopped up for firewood wood earlier today. I rub it up and down the steps, feigning the action of a male, a male elk making a challenge by worrying a low branch tree with its antlers. The bugling male explodes into the meadow, nostrils flaring, looking fierce and undaunted. I let out a whistle long and loud. Stanislaw has seen it too and rises up. He's a big white, Maramema, fierce as a demon. With me, he watches the rutting male. Even with my poor human olfactory equipment, the musky scent is virile and overpowering. The dog's hair is rising, but he doesn't bark. We are both awed. I'm skipping ahead a bit. It's later now, and I pull out my copy of Red Dog Flying by Gilda Trillum. It was written within about 30 miles of here in a cabin on the Utah side of Buckeye Reservoir. I'm supposed to write a small article about Trillum for the Association of Mormon Letters by tomorrow. She is the subject of this master's thesis. I'm working on a degree in literature. I'm doing it online from the Mervyn Peak Online University of the Arts and Sciences. It's not accredited yet, but they expect it to be such soon, and it's much cheaper than most schools. They were kind enough to accept me, even though my bachelor's degree was not distinguished in any sense, and I'd flunked out of, of another's master's program. So that sets the stage. He's, he's writing his master's thesis, and what he's done is he's collected a series of documents, and, and, and as he says, he, he's trying to discern Well, I'll just read it. My thesis is a compilation of Gilda Trillum's sources. I'm trying to fer ferret out whether Trillum was a mystic, a fraud, or a madwoman. I can't, I can let it slip now that I can't tell. So this, this opens. Um, she's a, a badminton champion in the 1950s. And um, so, so the book follows a little bit of that career. And, and as she, as she uh, works on her poetry, she works on, she, she, she's curious about the nature of things. She's trying to discern that. And, and she loses the Uber Cup, which is the big badminton contest, if, if you didn't know. Um, and and, and, and she, she becomes depressed and she travels to Soviet Russia in about 1961 to stay at a Orthodox monastery for a year. And um, what, she, what, she's, what she's doing there, she's trying to, to ferret out the nature of things. She wants to understand how she can incorporate those kinds of things. So she does a, a, a series of, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, I hate to say this word in front of art people, but uh, Kayascaro paintings, uh, playing with light and shadow. She, uh, she paints an apple seed. She wants to minim find out minimally what she uh, can learn from that apple seed by, by repeatedly painting it over and over again. And she does it on small blocks of wood like, like icons. And, and as she goes, she becomes more and more frustrated that she doesn't seem to understand the apple seed any better. And this is, this is something she wrote while she's staying. I sit down after my 45th painting and sigh and cry and then sigh again. I'm no closer to understanding this sea than when I started. It sits there on the, on the orange cloth, baiting me, calling me, daring me to find it out, to discover its way of being, to capture what it is under that brittle brown shell. I've packed painted it again and again, turned it nearly every angle, captured subtle nuances of its given aspect. I have been presented and handed all sides of this simple object, and yet nothing of what it is enters me. I've painted it in the morning and in the gloaming cloud of two seasons, in the afternoon and evening. I've placed the candle at numerous angles. I seem not to have come to know it at all. I thought by looking at it, its nature would slowly reveal itself, 
give me what was hidden. I don't mean to know its inner, soft inner fruit. Obviously, I could crush it, smear its green pulp over a glass, and peer at it until blurry eyed. But isn't that just another angle? Wouldn't that mess just be painting 46 through 67, say? Would I be any closer to getting it to it than I am now? It is silent. I've put it under a drinking glass and pressed my ear against its face for hours, not to hear the noise it makes, it makes none, but to sense its silence, to learn of the noises it does not make, and in that quiet reflection, find the seed as it is. Okay, she descends into madness a little bit here uh, as, she, as she contemplates that seed. And uh, I'm not gonna give you the, the full story, but I'm gonna get you to the main narrative arc she, uh, she loses her hand in South America, uh, ruining her badminton career. And um, she was right-handed, and she lost her right hand, unfortunately, in a, in a well, I'll let you read it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, she, she joins USO, uh, to entertain the soldiers, and you know how entertained soldiers are by minimalist novels, so <laughs> she was very, very popular. But uh, on her, on, on one of her trips, her helicopter is down by, by enemy fire, and she is taken as a prisoner of war uh, to a concentration camp, or a prisoner of war camp. And she suffers really humiliating degradation and, and hardship. And, and this is where the, the, the title comes from. And she's literally dying in one of the cells during the famine due to the American bombing with Agent Orange's crops have failed. And they're getting just barely anything to eat and, she, and she's dying. And she thinks she's going to die. And so they bring her her food and she doesn't want it. She offers it to the large rats that, that live in, um, uh, it, it's, 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 not, it's not like our rats. If, if you've been to Vietnam, you might have seen these in the forest, but they're rather large. And she, uh, she gives her food to the rats, and they leave, and then they return with their bellies full of garbage that they've collected around the camp, and they vomit into her bowl. And she, she finds a source of nourishment that's, that's unexpected. It's a beautiful scene. If you want to read a, a scene of eating rat vomit that'll just take your breath away, it's in here. Uh, but, but, but as the rats collect, as, they, as, as she, she gets to know them, and this is, these aren't like Cinderella rats that are doing her laundry and things. They're, they're just big rats. But she learns that by pointing to them, she can get them to squeak, and she, 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 she learns that they like lining up on the wall, this is how they communicate with each other, that, that she, by directing them, can, can get them to squeak by a gesture, and she starts a rat choir in her cell. This sounds a lot weirder than it, it really is. Uh, and, and how am I doing on time? I, I've really got to get to the good part. Okay, uh, this, is, this is, so uh, something happens of profound significance. She has a spiritual experience that changes her life. And, and she, she won't tell anybody what it is, she just mentions the fact. And so she's being interviewed for, for the Paris Review because of her minimalist novels. And they want to ask her about this because there's, there's been a, a, a report by one of her fellow Prisoners who tells a very different story than she tells, and she's and so this is DK is the interviewer and uh, Gilda is the she's answering his questions. Okay, to move on, I'm going to read you something that I think you'll find painful, but I think it's important to clear this up. This is from one of your fellow prisoners, Silka Peters. She has been fairly vocal in her condemnation of you, Gilda. I know DK. I should tell you I don't believe her. At least I don't want to. Gilda, it doesn't matter to me if anyone believes her or not. What she says is not true. DK, okay, but let me read what she said and then we can go from there. Gilda, if we must. DK, she says in this translation of an interview in the German magazine Der Stern, 
She arrived with two others. The rest of us had been there about three months. We noticed she got special treatment from the very beginning, and we suspected almost immediately there was something odd going on. Our cells were in the long cement block building. Her cell was near one end, so that she would come and go without being seen by the rest of us. It was also the largest and had the best ventilation. While we would spend every day laboring in the fields doing backbreaking work, she always stayed behind, sleeping with the guards and giving sexual favors to the camp officers in horrible and unspeakable ways. She was paid well for it. While we were nearly starving, she was well fed until in the end she was as fat as a pig. There was a squeaky mattress in her cell and on rainy days when we all stayed behind because it was too muddy to work, she would still be working the bedroll in whatever, in, with whatever guard uh, wished it. She had no shame. Although she spent the day nibbling on delicacies and the fine food the officers ate, she, she would still line up with us and take a portion of what little food we were offered. One year there was a terrible famine and several prisoners died. We were like bones walking, all except Gilda, who was as plump as a Christmas goose. She claimed she was eating rats, as many of us were, but they gave little nutrition and were wily and hard to catch, an obvious lie. When the Russians arrived, they were so enamored with her sexual tricks, they demanded of, of the Viet Cong that she be allowed to go with them. She did not even hesitate. No one was sorry to see her go. She was a constant reminder that there are those in war who lose their morals and turn into a corrupt and fetid shadow of what humans are supposed to be. She was a whore. And now that she's some big deal novelist, I find my mind even more disturbed about the attention she's getting. I find it disgusting that anyone would praise the work of such a vile creature. Gilda, sad, none of it's true. DK, why do you think she's lying about you? Gilda, I don't think she's lying, I think she's mistaken. I did not work in the field because my missing hand kept me from handling tools. I suspect that because I was not there helping with the labor resentment build, and there are stories that came as a way to feed these resentments. My last year there, I was treated very badly by my fellow prison, prisoners. Um, what did you do all during the day? I sat in my cell. And did you grow fat? By camp standards, I did not lose as much as they did. To them, I likely did appear fat, but I was much thinner than you see me now. I found a source of food that they did not enjoy. So you never slept with any of the guards? No. Did you have a mattress in your cell while they slept in straw? I slept on, as they did, on a bamboo mat. And if you did not work in the fields, how did you spend your days? Gilda largely bored, most at, almost out of existence. DK, you've hinted that you had some life-changing experience. There are rumors from your stay in New York that you claimed that you trained rats. Gilda, I'll not say anything about that. DK, won't you tell me what happened? No. It was holy, sacred. Shouldn't it be shared then, at least to dispel the claims by Silky Peters? Gilda, no, I will not share them. DK, we could all use more stories of encounters with the sacred, don't you think? Gilda, the holy must be experienced. I stood alone, a single individual, in awe of what had unfolded into the world. To try to share it would cheapen it. Only two things could happen. One, you might believe me and take my experience and embrace it, appropriate it. But you could only do so intellectually. It could only become another fact in the world. You might make rituals of it or art, but eventually it would become codified, institutionalized, and there would be authorized and unauthorized forms, sex. DK, wait, are you saying that your experience was so profound that in hearing it, I might start a new religion based on it? Gilda, maybe, but not likely. Let me give you the second scenario, which I think is what would actually happen. If I were to tell you, you would not believe me. You would strip it of awe and wonder. You would fossilize it, solidify it into a mere supposed fact of the world that is subject to analysis such that it might be accepted or rejected. But this happening was born into a world into which it will not easily fit. Therefore, by your lights, it would have to be rejected. You would strip it of possibility and of actuality. Your only response could be to mock it, to ignore it, to declare me mad, or simply a liar. All my experiences would then have to be interpreted to fit this sterile world. What scares me most is perhaps, 
Even I could be convinced by your dismissal. Maybe I could be brought to forget the wonder born in those soggy afternoons in a prison in Southeast Asia. Memory is a fickle thing. What if I tell you, tell the world, and teams of psychologists and philosophers all agree that I am mad and proclaim it with such force and conviction that I cannot bear the weight of their wagging fingers at my story's impossibility? What if under their therapeutic eye they lead me away from my experience and clothe me in the garments of their skepticism? They might declare my memories of the, imagine, the, the imaginations of a mind oppressed with the terror of my captivity. They might say it was a brain breaking under the strain of torture, malnutrition, degradation, filth, disease. Which is more likely, that Gilda Trillin lost her mind in a place where anyone would lose their mind, or that Gilda Trillin experienced a thing of such beauty and magnificence and breathtaking awe that it cannot be understood by a mortal mind. No, I will not tell you. To tell you would make it impossible. I know what I experienced, and to lose that would be to lose everything. Do not cast pearl before swine and all that. DK. So when others are presented with Peter's story, they must believe either your fellow prisoners' detailed accounts or believe you were engaged in activities so sacred and awesome and holy that in a filthy cinder block prison suffering the most humiliating and awful conditions, that to tell them of it would strip it of meaning. Should we just trust you on this? Gilda, trust me? Heavens no. All I can do is encourage you to enter the world with open and daring eyes and see how the wonder and grandeur of this world manifests itself to you. To trust me would be absurd. Um, how am I doing? Okay. If you read the book, you actually get to read about the experience. Which, uh, I'll read, let, let me read one, one line. Just, just to... Just to, sit, get to, to whet your appetite. So, no. Okay. Her, one of her beloved rats has been killed by a guard. And she's, she's, she's thought back to when her father raised a horse um, from being passed out. She wants to get a blessing. She wants to give the rat a blessing, but she tries. She gives it a blessing and nothing happens. Still on my back, looking straight up, I saw a figure descending from the sky, as if from an immense height, but oddly still within the room, giving the impression, impression that I was seeing into a new dimension. With each uh, reflection scattering light back and forth forever, a woman, for a woman it was, descended until she stood above me. She was dressed in a lovely blue silk with several long strings of white pearls. A red sequin clutch hat just covered her short style and straight hair. Her shoes were gorgeous blue heels that shimmered like emeralds. Her black skin glowed like a shimmering pool on a moonless night, and her eyes were bright and alive beyond life. Most amazing of all was her smell. It was of newborn babies, fresh autumn hay, rich, moist soil, and lavender and sunshine. It was of honey dripping from the calm, baked bread and sweet red wine. It was of newness and pine, just open books and incense and beeswax, and oddly, the fresh scent of manure and spring planting, and the milk of a mother's breast. It seemed so complex and full, I wanted to melt into it. You are a shepherdess, I spoke in a hushed tone. 